absolutely brilliant. You can listen to it again and again, as I'm sure you could, that video clip again and again. So I will share that uh, as part of the slide pack. And I think she, she expresses it in such a condensed way that we could basically spend the entire time here listening to that video clip again and again until we fully integrate the insights that she offers there. And in some ways, everything I'm going to talk about tonight is just an elaboration on um, what she has taught in, that, in those five minutes. So the core thing that we're dealing with in the Enneagram is overcoming and easing ourselves out of our habitual life scripts and our ingrained responses to be able to achieve more responsivity and flexibility in the moment to be able to respond to all the possibilities that are offered in the moment so that we, we aren't in autopilot. We aren't in our mechanical ego. So Gojek was always emphasizing this difference between essence and the mechanical ego. So all our work in cultivating this, the inner observer is, as Helen Palmer was saying, self-observing the ways in which our passion and the suffering of our heart is finding expression in these different territories that we have to be in as part of being a human being. So this freedom that we're looking for, this expansive range of possibilities, we could call spacious freedom divine. And I like to think about it in that way. As we have this infinite consciousness, we have the capacity to choose. We have the ability to find those six seconds in which to choose our response to the moment. And the more that we can cultivate that, we experience the divine feeling of that spaciousness. And that's really a lot of what the virtue and the holy idea really feel like. When you start, when you start having more moments of the holy idea, it's an experience of that freedom and ease of being. And I'm sure every single one of you can speak about a moment in which you felt genuine, serenity, humility, equanimity, etc. if we went around the virtue. So, so really, this work that we're doing tonight is about moving towards greater ease of being through being able to self-distantiate from what's going on with our ego in terms of the structure that Helen Palmer is talking about. So the instincts, the passions, the subtypes, and how that all fits together as a kind of structural model that we can step back from and say, wait a minute, I don't have to do that. I can see what's going on. I'm being triggered. My instinctual responses are being triggered. Let's slow down, take a few minutes and find some objectivity and balance that allows us to access a wider range of possibilities and not just go into our automatic reactive response. So I'm sure most of you know this. If you've been exposed to the Enneagram, this is really what it's about, and I'm sure you know it. But what I find is it's always helpful to hear these things in different words and from different perspectives, because it deepens our, it deepens our integration of these concepts. So I hope I'm not boring you with too much of what you already know. You can just go like this if I am. <laughs> Okay, so some of these slides. Okay, let's talk about what are the instincts and where are they? A lot of us use like neuro stuff in our coaching. So I like to at least add a little bit of depth around that. So a lot of us go to our clients and we say, you know, there's this and it's the amygdala and then there's the prefrontal cortex. I think it's time for us to get a little bit more sophisticated in our communication with our clients about the kind of neurophysiology of in emotional intelligence and that kind of thing. This information has been around for 20 years. So let's try and bring in a little bit more sophistication. So the amygdala, as you know, is a very old part of our brains and it is where the fight or flight uh, instinctual triggering happens. It just is, is a very primary response to things. It's also got a relationship to our memories. So there's a strong relationship to early childhood memories and things like smells. 
that will trigger a response in us and want us to make a decision. And that's where the, um, the thalamus and the hypothalamus are also involved in this. So I'm completely out of my depth with this stuff and I'm not trying to pretend to be a neurosurgeon or a cognitive scientist, but I think it's worth just getting a little bit more complexity than amygdala versus prefrontal cortex. So we're dealing with different parts of the brain that are in dialogue. They're parts of the brain that are trying to suppress some of our emotional reactivity. And there's almost a competition going on between the parts of our brain that want to do fight, flight, freeze and fawn, you know, they're more than just fight or flight. And the part of our brain that's saying, wait a minute, let's really assess the situation. And that's this prefrontal part of our brain, which is responsible for that thing we call reasoning, which is in quite short supply in many parts of the world, as we've seen recently in the, the political manifestations. And so it's about planning, thinking ahead about consequences, not to do the thing we instinctually want to do, which might be the fight or the flight, and to override and suppress some of those instinctual responses. So the cultivation of the inner observer strengthens our ability to slow down, bring in some metacognition and say, okay, I'm having a fantasy of murder, I probably shouldn't do that, etc. So being able to think about the consequences, think about where those feelings might be coming from in terms of memories. So to notice, geez, I'm being triggered, that reminds me of, etc. So be, being able to bring in a, a sane person. Okay. And this is some of what I find very interesting. It's a beautiful, complex uh, picture of the relationship and the processes involved in the self-regulation. So the thing that I've been finding interesting, I've discovered that when you put people in an MRI machine and ask them to think about themselves, like to reflect on their own way of thinking about something, part of the brain that lights up is um, the anterior cingular cortex. And, and that is part of the brain that's involved in some of these things like appraising whether or not our emotions are appropriate, being able to modulate our, our responses, this function of executive monitoring and pro-sociality, which is moral reasoning, like to say, okay, this is what's going on with me, calm down, take a deep breath. So their functions, their places in the brain where well, we don't know for sure whether it's a structure or a process that's distributed, but we're starting to understand the relationship between different parts of the brain in terms of self-regulation. So it's really, really interesting stuff. Okay, so now let's get into this idea of the split between instinct and subtype or the distinction, not the split. And um, some of the structural elements that are important to understand when you're doing this Enneagram work. Okay, so the first thing we need to know, when we hear the subtype stuff, we sometimes think that there's some kind of hierarchy, one is better than the other, because of the fact that conservation instinct is concerned with self-preservation, sexual is concerned with the one-on-one -on -one, and social is concerned with the group, we often make an assumption that the social instinct is kind of more ben benevolent and less selfish and that we need to just dump straight away because that is erroneous thinking. There, as, as Helen Palmer says, these are different territories and we need to survive in each territory. We need to survive in our body. We need to have... Um, connection with the people that really matter to us. And we need to know where we stand in the social domain. But all of that is about survival. So there's no one that's better than the other. Okay, some of the great stuff, Tom Condon, also one of the most fantastic teachers. If you don't know about him, you must make a plan to find out about him. He's brilliant. He's got a website called The Change Works, and there are all kinds of brilliant courses you can download from there. 
So what he says about the, the instinct is that it's the area in which our thinking is most compulsive. So our subtype is a manifestation, our dominant subtype is the area in which our thinking is most compulsive. It's where our attention is channeled. It's where we fixate it. And he talks about it as a distortion. So what Helen Palmer was saying was how we sort information. It's the same thing. It's like we overly concerned with one type of information. So as a sexual subtype, I'm so concerned with how close is our bond. So if Renata is in a bad mood and she doesn't speak to me in a nice tone of voice, I probably have a nervous breakdown because you know it's so distressing to have interpersonal dissonance in a close relationship for a sexual type. Whereas a self-praise type, it doesn't, they don't even really notice it that much. So these things cause a preoccupation with things that are within the territory of our dominant instinct. So, so that's something to, to bear in mind and it'll become clearer and clearer going forward that it's a distortion. And when Helen Palmer says it's uh, one of the areas has a glitch, so we'll have a glitch in the conservation instinct growing up or we'll have a glitch in our one-on-one -on -one relationship, maybe with one of our parents or both, or we'll have a glitch in the social. So that could be the household, it could be our neighborhood, it could be something in some environment where we feel very insecure. And so that becomes our predominant preoccupation is where am I? Who am I with? Am I safe? So, so that's really the main emphasis is that the subtype is a distortion and an over preoccupation based on an instinctual glitch, let's put it that way. Catherine Forth, um, the woman who came up with the concept of the tri-type, Ichazo came up with tri-fix, so it's not entirely original, the idea that we have a dominant type in each center, but Catherine Forth really did massive research on it. She developed the tri-type test, and she has contributed massively to the Enneagram world by helping us to understand this. And what she offers in terms of understanding the dominant uh, instinct and the subtype is also that our instinctual, dominant instinctual type is the area of greatest weakness. So you see the common theme. Um, you know, if I go around saying I'm a self praise for, it's, it's what I'm basically disclosing is where my wounding lies. So the instinctual drive is the thing that will trigger the type fixation. It will trigger your subtype, basically. Um, yeah, and the fixation and the drive are interactive. You'll see I've made a little kind of map of how the things fit together. Instincts, vice, fixation, subtypes. You can kind of get a sense of the layering of these things. Okay. So so um, instincts, as I said earlier, very, very primary. We're talking about 500 million year old aspects of our neurophysiology. These things are really old, they're really primal and they are completely survival oriented. So they are imperatives. They are survival imperatives. They don't care about rationality and reason and, you know, social appropriateness. And Aranya quotes David Daniels on this. He says, it's not they do or they don't, it's they do or they do. Um, so we can't uh, pretend they're not there. And even if we are transcended and enlightened being, they kind of baked in to our, our physiology. And the best we can do is learn to self-observe with compassion and self-mercy. That's the one I discovered the other day from Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist teacher, which I really love. So self-mercy and self-compassion and being able to hold what we're experiencing with love 
and in that spaciousness to be able to choose wisely. Okay. So this picture for me very well symbolizes the subtype fixation. It's something that in our minds and in our behavior, we like to rationalize. We like to think it's okay. And as Helen Palmer says, we express our emotional coping strategy through the fixation in a controlled and safe way. But behind the scenes, there's a very wounded, distorted and compulsive creature that is hidden in the dark. So for me, this golem is a good analogy for this wounded and traumatized part of ourself that is obsessed with something. So in his case, it's this ring, the precious. But each one of us has a precious that we are after, that is the fixation of our vice, the fixation of our passion. So for seven, the gluttony is this grasping and attachment. For each type, there's something that we after, and the vice is our recipe to get there. And the fixation is a way of rendering that vice socially acceptable. Okay. So, and the, yeah, rendering the fixation socially acceptable. Okay. So, Eng, sorry, just repeat that. You said the fixation is the, the passion. The fixation renders the passion acceptable. So what the fixation does, it provides almost a mental rationalization yeah. for the passion. And then the subtype expresses it in a way that you think is socially okay. In yeah, sorry, I thought the second time you said it, you said it opposite. So it's the fixation that justifies and rationalizes the passion. Yeah. And then the subtype provides a way for expressing the two in a way that's relatively safe and controlled. Does that make sense? I think yeah, it'll if, make you're, if you're able to give an example of through one of the types, but I'm sure you'll get there. Yeah. So if you think about um, a self-preservation act, okay, so you're dealing with lust and you're dealing with vengeance. So lust is the passion. And we're not talking sexual lust, we're talking about lust in a much broader sense. It's a libidinal energy to dominate, to be invulnerable, to grab everything you can out of life with a kind of voraciousness. So that's lust. There's a vengeance element to the fixation of eight, which is fighting against the childhood and wanting to take vengeance against perceived injustice that's actually a historical thing from, the, from childhood. So what happens with the subtypes? If you take the self-preservation act, for example, they will find very good ways to make being tough and hard fine. They'll almost be proud of it, like grow up, get over it. So that's the self pres manifestation of lust and vengeance. And we all think, yeah, well, fair enough. You know, life is tough, grow up. So it is safe and controlled in a way to express it. The sexual subtype of, of eight is very rebellious and kind of, you know, overtly I'm bad. And they've taken the scapegoat role in the family. So their way of expressing lust and vengeance is kind of more visible, but it's also presented in such a way that it's a form of rebellion that we can kind of enjoy in a way. So for each type, the, the, the subtype provides a mask that makes some expression of the passion possible in these different domains. So I hope that's making a bit of sense. But for each subtype around the Enneagram, we could go into an hour, at least, of talking about these relationships. So let's see where we go. Okay, I'm really not expecting you to read the slide. I'm showing off how I have uh, summarized it for you. So this is going back to Ichazo. And Ichazo said the, this word subtypes is actually a misnomer. It's a misclassification. 
So he speaks about we've got a main fixation type, which would be what we call our subtype in kind of today's language. But then we've got the other two, which he calls co-egos. So he's also there providing um, backup for what Helen Palmer says about we've got all three. We've got all three subtypes. We've got all three co-egos in Echazo's language. One of them just happens to be the main fixation type. Okay. So when we are working with our subtype, which is one of the surest routes towards evolution within this work, not main type, working with the instincts and the subtype, we have to work with all three territories at once. So we have to be conscious. How is my type showing up in the self-preservation domain? How is it showing up in the one-on-one -on -one domain? How is it showing up in the social territory? So that we can see the subtleties of what we're doing. And we start being able to you know one of the metaphors is catch ourselves. I don't like too many police-like metaphors, but uh, yeah, it's becoming more self-aware. So let's look at the how Chazo speaks about these three. So the conservation instinct is what he called self-preservation. The conservation instinct is, it's always a historical ego. So what's happening here is that the person is remembering some feeling of deprivation or danger in childhood, and they're projecting it onto the present moment. So they are feeling far more dangerous, in, uh, endangered than they need to based on almost like a continuous flashback of childhood. So I've got to say an Enneagram, um, uh, seven strong wing, eight client. And he says, my mother always used to say, life owes you nothing. And from that four year old message, he's got his entire reality strategy built around that. I don't think I ever had one coaching session with him that he didn't say life owes you nothing. And that's his rationalization for being really tough. So he's projecting that historical reality of deprivation in childhood and a lineage of deprivation onto the present moment. So often um, the conservation instinct people have had um, ancestral uh, things like deprivation, poverty, and there's a history there in the lineage often of safety issues, safety trauma. So um, it could be violence in the home, uh, gangsterism, drugs, addiction, all kinds of things um, that, uh, that might be being projected onto the present. And I'm not saying that the other types don't have childhood trauma, but they don't bring it to the present moment in quite the same way. So the conservation or self-preservation the his, historical ego, the childhood ego is what's arriving in the moment. And then you've got the constant question, how am I? Am I okay? Am, am I okay? Looking at your body like, oh, you know, have I got tissues? Have I got a jersey? Did I bring my umbrella? Where are my vitamins? So there's a preoccupation with one's personal immediate well-being. Then you've got the social instinct, and that's in the in the territory of the broader group and there we're talking not about the historical ego but about the image ego so who am I with how am I being perceived do I belong where am I in the hierarchy um, am I being protected am I protecting am I winning am I losing am I safe in this broader context and what roles are going on here? Who's playing what role and what role do I need to play? So that's a totally different kind of consciousness. But the question is around image and who am I with? And then you've got the last one there, which is the syntony or sexual territory. So Naranjo calls it sexual. Ichazo called it syntony or adaptation. Catherine Ford calls it intimate. And um, so, you know, the different names for these things, it's nice to know all of them because they give a subtly different understanding. Like when you think of one-on-one -on -one connections in terms of syntony, that's almost like being on the same 
we've tuned our instruments to the same key. You know, like we're both on A440 and we are tuned. So that's like a metaphor for syntony, is are we getting each other here in this moment? And um, so social types are not that concerned with that. You know, they've got an agenda, they want to achieve something socially, they, they're positioning themselves, and the sexual subtype won't really, especially if social is repressed, they won't really get that. You know? So we misalign often at an instinctual level, which is a very interesting thing to observe. And we trigger each other as well. So a social type might trigger a sexual type because of that lack of um, alignment at a, at a very instinctual level. So that's also something to self-observe is, is one's instinctual anxiety playing itself out. So for example, if a dominant self-praise person goes on holiday with a dominant sexual, that self-praise might be triggered because the sexual doesn't care about this, their preoccupations as much as they do. So it's, it's very, very helpful to be aware of this stuff. Can um, I carry Ingrid on? You, quick question. Could you say more about the um, sexual question of, of where am I? What are some other questions that they might be asking? So I think you see these colors here. The red I always associate with the gut center, the green with the heart center, and the blue with the mental center. So there is a correlation between the self praise instinct and the gut, the body, because it's about the body. The social center, the social terrain has got an intrinsic connection with the heart center because the heart center in the Enneagram is all about belonging, connection, love, all of that stuff. And then the sexual one has got a connection with the, the head center. So the head center primary question is what's going on? Like, where am I? What's going on around here? Where existentially, um, mapping my way in the world, what risks are out there, who can I trust? Um, so, so that's the question of where am I linked to the sexual is around orienting myself in, in reality. But I think that primarily starts off with the mother, is where am I in relation, in the object relations to this, well, what we originally don't realize is separate, but then gradually takes the form of a separate person, we realize our needs aren't gratified instantly. And, and it becomes a sense, if it's, if it's in that immediate interpersonal one-on-one, -on -one, where am I, what's going on? You know, and feeling abandoned in that primary one-on-one -on -one connection. Does that make sense? So yes, that, and, that's very helpful, thank you. Yeah. So sexual type might have been adequately nurtured in terms of food, being warm, you know, that kind of stuff. But at the level of visibility and interpersonal connection, you know, the mother might have, you know, given the child the bottle but not made very much eye contact. And so the child is then feeling like, you know, they, they, they might be satisfied physically, but they don't feel a sense of deep connection to another person. And then they'll pursue that for the rest of their life is how do I feel safe in, in the kind of one-on-one -on -one space? Is that helping? Okay. Yes, that really, that makes it very clear. Thank you. Good. Okay, let's charge on because there's some other cool stuff. Okay, let's get on to this instinct thing and where it fits in. So for those of you who don't know, these are the subtypes. So they've each got a different name. Um, these are Naranjo's names for the subtypes. And the ones that have been highlighted in the colors of each of the centers are the counter types. So within each type, We've got the three, one of them is the counter type, where the expression of the passion is almost opposite. It's, it's an, it has to be expressed, 
but it gets masked by coming out as its opposite. So this, I think, is a very, very important map. And it's quite helpful to just really get to know all of these um, nicknames for the type or these names as a way of remembering, as a key. So if you're coaching a, a self-preservation for, you'll remember tenacity. OK, what does that mean? And, and it will be a key in to remembering um, some of the aspects that will be motivating that person. So it's still the same passion. It's still the same fixation. But the way in which it gets expressed differs according to the, the terrains, um, in, according to where the primary glitch is. So if your primary glitch is in the conservation, in the self praise in the physical safety, you're going to get one of these to go along with your type. You're going to get a tri-type, basically. You could have your tri-type will be all in one column, by the way. I'll get to that in a minute. But if you've got, if you've got, yeah, who's talking? Could you just please give an example, just say for, uh, not my own type, another one, say for, for four, tenacity and expressing opposite. Could you just give three pointers as to what that might look like quickly, just to help help me see it in a different way? Okay, let me, let me rather use six, because the self-preservation four is a particularly complex one. Yeah, so, that's why I asked for it, but that's okay. That's, that's an hour. Um, right. so, okay, <laughs> let, let's look at the more famous um, counter type, the sexual six. The counter type of six is strength or beauty. The other word for it is beauty. So what sexual sixes have is the same level of terror and fear as any other six. The heart wound of six is the terror-stricken heart. So we've got the fear playing itself out, and there's a lot of the usual fixation, cowardice, and doubt. And But the way that that manifests for the sexual six is almost the opposite of the other two sixes. So the self press six looks for warmth. I mean, looks for connection and safety by being very warm. I won't hurt you if you don't hurt me. I'll be very loyal to you. I'll love you and my home is my place of safety. So the self press creates a very warm and safe environment in their immediate context and uses that warmth strategy wherever they go. So it's a very compliant style of six. So it's in the compliance uh, triad and it's very recognizable as six. It's a six-ish way of being a six. Then we've got the sexual six as the counter type, which instead of um, kind of being compliant and going along with people and um, trying to really belong as a way of achieving security. Sexual sixes are quite rebellious, quite challenging. They'll stop you dead in a meeting and they'll be much more emotionally real um, in, in the other sixes. They'll say, wait a minute, this is absolutely not going to work. And, you know, they'll be, they'll have a, a feeling almost uh, like an aggression in their way of expressing their fear. So, they'll charge towards fear rather than cower and or seek belonging in the way that the other sixes do. So some people mistake a sexual six for an eight and some sexual sixes mistake themselves for eight and take a long time to discover their type because they've got the same um, presence in a sense, but you can feel it's fear-based when you get to know it better and they've got that kind of bring it on, bring it on thing that, that eights don't really have. You know. So does that help a bit, Lynn, in terms of... Yeah, thank you for doing that. I really appreciate it. Okay. So just a little bit on the four. So four tenacity. Instead of the envy playing out in relation to other people and feeling oneself being inferior to another person. Envy is not about wanting what someone else has. We need to not think of fours in that way at all. They're not envying what you have and wanting it. 
So it's not like coveting in the biblical sense. It really is comparing oneself to others and feeling deficient and inferior, like seeing someone doing something or being successful or expressing themselves in a, in a way that is unselfconscious, four will feel like, oh, I can't do that. So noticing their own inadequacy in relationship to others. Now, what happens with tenacity as the self-praise counter type is fours almost envy the way in which other people are taken care of in their bodies and in their security. So the envy gets expressed in a kind of inverted way as I'm just going to push through. Tenacity is pushing through. It's stoical. It's bearing suffering. It's long suffering. So where other fours might complain and um, express their shame and want to talk about it and want attention about it. I'm sorry if I'm being disparaging. If we went through each of these, every single person would be hiding under the table. Um, but it's about suffering in silence and, and can be very self-destructive. So normal self-praise is um, quite self-preserving. That's what it stands for. But when you get to the counter types within self-praise, it comes out very differently. Okay. I love you. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Okay. So I don't think I've got too much time to go into this, but what I want to emphasize is that you can look at it across and you can look at it down. So within type eight, you've got all three. Within each type, you've got all three. And then it's very helpful to also look across types. So get to know the subtypes within a type and get to know the common features of self-praise across types and including obviously how they, um, the, how the counter types look. So it's, it's important to keep looking at things from different angles and joining dots. It just really deepens your, your understanding of this thing. Okay. Um, what do I want to say here? Oh, okay, this is just a little bit more about the counter type. So Lynn, you'll be happy here. I forgot I made the slide. The self-preservation instinct, which is usually I must conserve, is channeled through envy as the universe conserves other people better than me. So other people are being looked after better than I am. So I might as well just be masochistic and not care about myself. So I'll keep pushing through but that masochism can take a very dark turn. Um, so self-preservation falls often go into extreme self-neglect, um, addiction. There are lots of things that can get quite bad uh, with a self praise fall. So it's not self-conservation at all. It doesn't look like that. It doesn't look self-preserving. It looks self-destructive. So that's, that's a bit more about the self praise fall. There's the six one, I already spoke about them. So that's getting big and uh, aggressive as a way of handling fear. And then you've got the um, social eight, which becomes channeling all that vengeance towards more of a social cause. So it's about that kind of justice warrior solidarity. So they've got a slightly softer sense about them sometimes because their their vengeance is expressed in a way that is something we can probably identify with more easily you know being against injustice that's great who doesn't like that but it's a mask for lust and vengeance it's still a mask it just it's not as easily recognizable as the others okay so this Helen Palmer again, I think she's just brilliant. So here we've got look at the vice and the fixation and how it expresses itself in a particular territory. So if you look at social two, pride and false abundance show up in terms of social standing. So um, that's where it manifests, but it definitely is still pride and it definitely is still false abundance. 
Same with social three. Vanity and deceit will show up in terms of social standing. So it's there, the social three is the most kind of stereotypical three. It's about prestige. It's about telling a good story to a VIP audience. It's about name dropping. So there's that grandiosity associated with the social three because it's image in a social context. It's got to be visible in a broad way. It's not enough to, to you know, it's, it's not the same as it manifesting in other spaces. So, and then the social seven, gluttony and ego fraudulence, but it's in the social domain. And there, to, to get your gluttony desires satisfied, your, your ego fraudulence of wanting to be a certain type of person in the social domain turns into the counter type of seven, which is I've got a gluttony for looking good by being self-sacrificial because it is quite difficult to express gluttony socially. How do you do it? You can't really. So you've got to do the opposite and look good for not doing it. So that's where seven social sevens are gluttonous for feeling like they're a good person, doing something good for humanity and sacrificing themselves, but they make sure that people know about it. And then you've got the social eight, lust and vengeance in a social setting. So for each subtype, ask yourself, what is the passion? What is the fixation? And how's it being expressed in this territory? And you ask yourself that as well, for how is my, my passion and my fixation playing out in each of these different territories? And then you probably get a very big fright. Okay. Um, oh, this is um, this is how we can take one of our fixations or our, our subtype strategies and apply it in another domain. So this example is where we could take warmth from the self praise and rather apply it in our intimate relationships. So we can use our subtype. We can use our strategy for self-praise in the sexual domain. We can use our strategy for sexual in the social domain. So it's not limited. What they're trying to say here is if you've got your self-praise seven set of behaviors, it's not only in the self-praise domain that you're going to do that. You can use those behaviors in different spaces. So I think we just need to, I think that what we're highlighting here is that it's not a neat set of boxes, that our, our passions and our fixations are going to be applied where they can be and where it suits us. I think just coming back to that question of it's controlled and it's safe. So we're going to Use these strategies wherever they come in handy, wherever we feel that we can, basically. Okay, so we've gone through this stuff. This is a summary again of the Achazo, just with a little bit more. But I think what I want to do is get into going through each of these a little bit deeper and then going into breakout groups so that we can talk about how in the last week we've noticed our instinctual strategy making itself known. So how, if you're a self-praise type and you know you are, how has your self-praise played itself out in the last week or your sexual dominance subtype? So we'll, we can maybe do that. Let's see how it goes. Okay. So self-praise, usually there it's about archetypal nurturing and attachment issues. It's got to do with the maternal archetype. So not necessarily the mother per se, but the idea of nurturing. That's about, am I fed? Am I warm? Am I, am I comfortable? And am I physically safe? So there, um, that's what that instinct is really all about. 
So the shadow side of that is being um, putting, putting oneself first. So being preoccupied with self and um, can be very privacy seeking. So it can wall off um, focused around those needs. Repressed can um, lead to self-neglect. So if the self-preservation instinct is repressed, there's a neglect of sleep, diet. Sometimes people work all day without eating and without getting up to go to the bathroom. So you know, um, the repression of that instinct will play out in the opposite way. And for the subtypes, we need to be aware that it comes out differently. Okay, so this is self-praise concerns about comfort. It's also about resources. So self-preservation instinct is also very concerned, not just with do I have food, do I have water, but do I have time? What energy do I have available? So you've got to think about conservation in terms of energy as well. So the self-preservation five, for example, is trying to conserve energy. The self-preservation three is incredibly concerned with efficiency. Don't waste my time. Let's get from point A to point B as quickly as possible because energy is in short supply. We've got to maximize our use of it. So this is the self-press, food, resources, comfort, energy. And that also translates obviously into money. Then the um, sexual instinct. So obviously there's an interpersonal intimacy dimension to it. So the sexual uh, word is not easy to forget. Um, there's an intensity about sexual subtypes and about the sexual instinct. So if you think about the idea of eros in Greek mythology and um, in Freud as well, erotic energy is libidinal energy. It's not necessarily sexual. It's our creative vitality. If you look at the meaning of the second chakra in, um, in uh, yogic mapping of the body and in, in Hinduism, the second chakra is called Svadhisthana, and it's where our sexual energy is, but it's also where our creative energy is. There's, there's, a, there's a creative power to our sexual energy. So you find that where you have the sexual instinct dominant, there's, there's got that um, expressive uh, nature to it. And there's some boldness, there's some assertiveness, even in the non-assertive types, you'll find that the sexual subtype is more assertive and more fiery. Uh, it's got to do also with mystical union. Uh, it's got to do with the bringing together of the masculine and the feminine. So that's where this mystical union idea comes from, is that we're talking about something that's quite transcendent. Uh, so that's where this, uh, the, the mystical orientation is often in the sexual subtype. Repressed, you find um, a repression of that vitality. It can be a kind of low energy. Um, and people that have got repressed sexual find intimacy quite invasive. So they don't really want it and can be physically unaffectionate as well. So, so that's some of the sexual. See there, it's just really the sense of there's a, there's a powerful drive in Eros. And then also it can manifest as wanting to look good. It's this thing of wanting to attract somebody, wanting to attract a mate, wanting to establish very secure one-on-one -on -one relationships. So that can take on a literally sexual dimension. So self-praise three, wants to be the kind of perfect Hollywood man or woman. So the nickname for um, sexual three is masculine or feminine. So that's about really looking good. Um, the, let me think of another example. Yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll get there. I've lost my train of thought. Essex two, Ing. Essex two. 
speaks to all about seduction through intimacy. And then the and SX also the image of the femme fatale, you know, like just that <laughs> very sexy, attractive, magnetic. Yes, very magnetic. So the sexual two is like a woman is like the Venus Aphrodite archetype, kind of irresistibly, there's a sexual magnetism. And then the sexual eight is kind of a, an intense uh, possession. So you'll feel as though you, you're in the, uh, yeah, in the possession of a very, very powerful um, energy. If you if you get into alignment with the with an E six eight, thanks, Renata. Okay, then we've got the social, and this is more as we said the territory of belonging, hierarchy, knowing where you stand, who am I with, how am I perceived in this uh, context. So it's about. Um, Establishing visibility, knowing how to, where to, what's appropriate in which context, what position to adopt. So um, there can be a shadow side of being manipulative. And if it's uh, repressed, it can be very out of touch with sadness. I don't particularly understand that connection. But what happens with social, and possibly this is just how it is, is that socials um, can feel somewhat emotionally disconnected because emotion is not really welcome, let's put it that way, in a social context. So expressions of one's deep emotions uh, don't land well in a social context. So that's why um, it can feel that socials are a bit disconnected and therefore also out of touch with the sadness. I hope that makes sense. Renata, is there anything that you want to add to that? I don't know if I've expressed it clearly. So in what I'm trying to understand is you're saying social repressed is often out of touch with sadness and then you've got the repressed headline, don't enjoy groups. So is that the same thing? You're saying if somebody, like I'm social, I have social repressed. On my integrative Enneagram report, I have 1% in social and that's probably an exaggeration. It's probably closer to zero, um, which is also why I started this group. <laughs> so I wanted to force myself into groups and 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 and, and uh, it's been four years I've hosted this group and and I've, I've learned to love being part of a group which for the first time in my life because I've actively avoided them my entire life so um and I, being out of touch with sadness but then you know I'm a I'm a self-preservation three with with no social so I would have uh, um, for most of my life, I was out of touch with sadness. And when I first met the Enneagram and it said that, you know, the heart center types two, three, and four have issues with, you know, shame, self-esteem and sadness or grief. I was like, sadness? Nah, you know, never, I've never, you know, I, I, I have no sadness. And um, yes, as I've observed, there is like, just, there's an underlying existential sadness all the time with threes including me so yeah so that would um I don't know if that's what you mean because it's the shadow it, it, it's also a part of it when it's repressed yeah the struggle to self-promote um I didn't realize that that was for all types who uh have social repressed because I know for self-pressed threes in particular self-promotion is very hard Yes, that's because it's the anti-vanity. So I think for three, there's a particular way that this works. But I'm happy you said that because there's a distinction between the shadow of the instinct and the repressed. And I think that's that's what we're getting at. So, um, yeah. Mm. Have you spoken to that bottom line yet? The repressed, not just a blind spot that we actually mock it or have disdain for it in people who have it as dominant. Because I think that's really uh, just, that was such an insight for me. Yes, that is really great because it also helps us to discover what our repressed instinct is. 
So if there are any of these that you really can't relate to, and you think, why would somebody be so worried about that? Um, and isn't that silly? Then that's most likely to be your repressed instinct. So if you think it's ridiculous for somebody to pre-book all their accommodation on an international trip and make sure they've got two dressing gowns and all their vitamins and an umbrella. And then if you think it's ridiculous and you would never do that, then you have soft press repressed, most likely. And if you look at this picture of the guy standing in front of an audience and you think, ah, oh, he's such a show off, he's such an, he's so egotistical, blah, 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 then you might have social repressed because it's something that we have slight distaste for. Repressed means we push it away. And, and whichever one you, you feel a slight contempt for, or you think is just silly, that's going to be your repressed one. Thanks for that, Renata. That's a very, I found that a very helpful insight. Ing, I know this is off the topic, but I think whatever we repress, sometimes, I mean, I'm actually thinking this out loud and asking a question, really. Um, we often mock in, in others. So the core issues in the centers, um, you know, I, I look at five, sixes, and sevens with their fear and anxiety, and I go like, what is that? Like, you know, <laughs> that's so silly, you know? And my best friend who's an eight looks at my self-esteem issues and goes, that's ridiculous. So just, um, I think when it comes to anything that's repressed, we judge it and think it's ridiculous in others, perhaps. What do I think is ridiculous and make fun of? We must test this. Yeah, I think so. Generally, I think it's a bit of a rule. Okay, so let's let's go on a bit. Okay, so that's the social. The shadow there is seen as politically manipulative, expedient, um, can be uh, using people as a means to an end in terms of social positioning. But then also, you know, leading change, making change on a big scale. So social types are good at pulling things off on a large scale and driving change at that level. There's my favorite from South Africa, Chris Hani. Most of you probably don't know him. Brilliant, brilliant person with integrity, political integrity. Okay, then let's look a little bit at Uranio Paez and B. Chestnut, who do a lot of work on subtypes. B wrote a whole book on the subtypes, 27 subtypes. And Uranio consistently speaks about how working with the instinct and the subtype is the path. It's the way of dealing with our own um, transformation. So wings, not so much. Tri-type, no. You work with the instinct and the subtype if you really want to grow spiritually. And the important thing to know here is the subtype is all pervasive. It's not just sometimes that we do it. It's a pervasive, 100% of the time, distortion and preoccupation. 100% of the time, we are filtering information according to our subtype. And this is quite a shocking realization when you realize just, just how true it is. It's end to end. It's the primary filter. And it even colors how we think about the divine. So depending on your subtype, you'll probably have a matching idea of God. Um, you'll have a matching idea of your super ego. It's, it's literally everywhere. And um, it's very funny when you start noticing how it shows up all over the place. So yeah, they also emphasize that the main subtype, the primary fixation is where our biggest wounding happened in childhood. So the subtype is an attempt to uh, find compensation for that. So they call it excessive compensation. And then Uranio also points out how the sequencing or the stacking 
of the subtypes matters. So this is like even more in the deep end of what difference it makes if you've got first self prayers, then sexual, then social, or first self prayers, then social, then sexual. So, you know, Peter, notice, yeah. How fluid are those? Is stacking, can stem your stacking change or no. become more balanced? No? It definitely can become more balanced. And part of the work is to balance the instincts. So if you've got a repressed self prayers, you've got to do work on balancing it because we need to have all three. As Helen Palmer was saying, we exist in three domains, three territories, and healthy instincts will lead to optimal functioning in each of those domains. So if you've got a repressed self prayers, you have to work on it because your conservation and your grounding on this earth is in your body. So you, you, know, you have to look after it. So any area where there is imbalance, you can balance it. But like your main type, your main wound is your main wound, and that's your sexual's lifetime. So that's your deck of cards, and you will be playing with that deck until the day you die. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, no, it's just interesting because if you're, if, you know, whatever you're repressed is and you spend a lot of time and attention and focus working on that, um, and potentially there's an external factor, I wonder if there's, could possibly be like a switch between your, your second and third. I've never heard of that. No, I don't, I've never come across that as a possibility in any other land. Same as type, there's not one teacher who'll say, you can change your main type if you try hard enough. It's such a core feature and it's pre-conscious and it might even be neurological. I don't know if you've heard of Dan Seligman, but he gave a talk at one of the recent Enneagram summits about how there are three kind of neurological uh, centers in our brain. I can't remember exactly how he put it, but Depending on those, there's an anxiety, an anger, and a shame center in the brain. And depending on which one of those gets activated earliest is which center we'll find ourselves in. And then on top of that is the context. So if, if the shame center is activated and the belonging center, then we have to choose between two, three, and four. Mm -hmm. If the rest is activated we're going to choose choose in inverted commas because it's unconscious but our reality strategy will either be eight nine or one if we've got the neurological predisposition for anxiety then our strategy is going to be five six or seven and then the subtype is an additional overlay on that is how is this anxiety going to find expression in the world and which of the domains is most wounded so it's, it's incredibly layered. And I'm sorry, I can't tell you more about the Dan Seligman thing. I can't remember it very clearly. But it is worth tracking him down because he's a, a neuroscientist and he knows the Enneagram very well. And he's made amazing connections between these domains. Okay. Ingrid, this is Chris. Uh, I've been very lucky to work with Dan and uh, if anyone wants to learn more about his work go to his website which is Mindsight and it's the Mindsight Institute and he does a lot of work on mindfulness um, and he's a social cognitive neuroscientist. Brilliant thank you thanks Chris that's great say what he is again a social cognitive neuroscientist. Social cognitive neuroscientist. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you. That's great. I'm so glad you're here. Cool. Is there anything you want to comment on about what I just said about those three neurological centers? I mean, it sounds ridiculous. It sounds like they're like three light bulbs in your head. Is there anything that you can add to what I said there? Um, I'm not in the best of places to be able to do that today, if that's okay. Sure. <laughs> sure. Okay, let's go on. Okay, so now we're talking about structure. Helen Palmer speaks about structure. Before I say anything about that, there's no such thing, right? I mean, it's important for us to recognize that the Enneagram is a self-reading system. It's symbolic. 
and that we can't get stuck in this idea of structure and we shouldn't see other people as structures. We need to get into a process mindset and learn to be present with ourselves and others. Because what can happen when we get into structural thinking is we walk around thinking of ourselves as structures. And that can be a real trap uh, from an Enneagram perspective to constantly think about oneself in terms of type with all of these arrows and things going on. So what, whatever I'm about to show you has to be discarded later. Okay. So this is a, a kind of sense of the levels of development in the Enneagram, okay? So at the bottom here, the most basic layer of our psyche is our neurophysiology, plus the family context, the glitch in the instinctual area, our object relations, our lost childhood message, and our heart wound. So that sets the scene for the passion or the vice. So the vice is a response to all of this stuff. The nature and the nurture that lays the groundwork for our passion. And you know the word passion means suffering. So your passion is the emotional suffering that emerges from the combination of your wiring and your early childhood things, object relations, relationship with your parents, your context, which instinct is triggered most, etc. So you've got the the passion, then you've got the fixation, which is the mental aspect of that suffering. So you've got the heart passion, that's where the heart suffers. The fixation is kind of the suffering of the mind and the behavioral manifestation. Then you've got the subtype over here. So the subtype is the presentation of those two things in the world. So if I've got seven gluttony and seven ego fraudulence, that's gonna take one of three forms as the dominant fixation. So I'm gonna have gluttony and ego fraudulence either in a self praise or in a sexual or in a social way. So this is what Urania says here is that this subtype is the mask of the mask. So I think that's a very helpful thing. So here we've got the original suffering, the original trauma. That's early, early childhood trauma that gives rise to the vice or the passion. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. So that's, that's the first mask. The first mask is the passion because it's masking the heart wound. It's masking the original trauma and the passion is trying to be a cure for that. Then on top of that, we've got the mask of subtype as it emerges in our behavior. So the subtype is the mask of the mask and we've got to get to, through the subtype to understand our passion. So I, when I first heard the word gluttony, I was thinking, what do you mean gluttony? What? I, don't, I don't even identify with that. I hardly eat. No. Um, and I, I'm not an epicure. I don't like partying. I don't like this and that. I don't have a lot of the seven-ish stuff that you would associate with gluttony. But when you understand the sexual variant of gluttony and the way that gluttony and ego fraudulence are expressed in the sexual subtype of seven, then you're like, oh, now I understand what gluttony is. So it's very important to strip away your subtype, socially acceptable, controlled expression, and see, oh dear, what's really going on here is my fixation and my vice. You've got to get to the bottom of it to understand the vice is doing its thing here. If you want to grow psychologically, and if you want to go through your defense mechanisms and access the higher emotional qualities and the holy ideas, the higher mental qualities, this is the work. You've got to lay bare the vice and the fixation so that they can be transformed, consciously transformed. And, and that also involves getting through the defense mechanisms. So if you look at something like denial, 
All the defense mechanisms are, have a dual function. They protect us against ourselves and our own feelings, and they protect us against the world. So the defense mechanism of, say, identification in the three protects the three from their own inner pain by focusing on an external image, and it protects them from the onslaught of reality by keeping a focus on what they can be and that idealized ego. It stops them from dealing with the pain of potentially being rejected. So each defense mechanism plays that dual role and we have to get through that defense mechanism as part of unmasking, unmasking. So in the case of seven say it's rationalization. It's like, how am I rationalizing within my subtype? How am I denying as an eight? within my subtype. So denial takes its form in self prayers, sexual and social it takes a different form. And they're all kinds of traps and anti-self actions that are reinforcing that. Um, misguided interpretations of reality that reinforce the subtype and make us think it's okay. And not just that it's okay, that it's good and right and wonderful. And that's where we need to notice what's going on with ourselves is when we are kind of feeling proud of our subtype. Um, the one thing Orania said a few years ago that stuck in my head forever, and I, I've increasingly realized how true it is. He says, the appropriate relationship to the vice is horror. You need to, you need to recognize that your vice is something that you should be very, very aware of, hold it in your awareness and be afraid. <laughs> Not afraid, but you should, you should recognize the destructive potential of the vice. So I tend to go in that line of teaching that we, we mustn't hold back on recognizing the destructive potential of the passion. It's not cute, it's not quirky. It's, uh, it's got serious uh, ethical consequences. Okay. Um, can I go on or uh, is there anyone who doesn't have a clue what's going on here and I need to stop? This is like the whole Enneagram on one page. <laughs> Almost. Yeah. Ing, I think just something to mention is that uh, Narana swapped the three's um, passion and fixation. So in some of the literature, you're going to see this as being the other way around, where the passion is deceit and the fixation is vanity. So that was where Naranya uh, disagreed with Ichazo and changed what the, his teaching. Yeah, we had a little bit about a, a debate about that once. I stick with this. I don't know about you, but I think in terms of the seven deadly sins, which were then added to later on, vanity is one of the seven deadly sins, which later became nine, whereas deceit is a behavioral manifestation of vanity. So I think that's a good way to think of it, that the fixation is the behavioral manifestation of the passion that helps you to understand the kind of order of it. So ego planning is not a vice in itself. It's an expression of gluttony mm. in this example. Sloth, mm. indolence is not the vice, or acedia, I actually prefer acedia. Sloth is the vice. So yeah. it goes back to the, the early definitions of the vices, and the vices... Uh, were conceived by people like the Desert Fathers as the impediments to focus on the spiritual path, on prayer and meditation. So you can see that the, the fixations are not the primary impediment to spiritual growth. It's these lower emotional qualities that are the driver behind the impediment. So I hope that's making sense. 
Yeah. We're going into other aspects of the Enneagram, but I think it's helpful. Okay, let's look a little bit more. Hey, this might be, a, my self preds needs to go make a cup of tea and go to the bathroom. We've been going for over an hour and a half. So I think maybe it could be a time for a little break. Okay, cool. Let's do that. How long? Okay. Just nine minutes, like till it's 41, so until 50. Nine minutes is good. <laughs> okay. Nine everything. It's Enneagram. See you at, <laughs> at 10 minutes before the next hour. Okay, great. See you in 10. Ingrid, whilst I have you, do, do you... Um, Am I supposed to be expecting anything from you to read? It's just that next week for me is super, super busy. And I'm wondering if I would have any opportunity to do some reading over the weekend. Definitely. I'll send it to you later. I've got to send you the um, workbook. Uh -huh. And um, I've got a couple of other things that, that you need to look through. Okay, good. And then let me know about your invoice. And then um, I did not send you uh, Tom's comments. I will get that to you at some point in time. That is not my social aid trying to get into a place of manipulation. It genuinely was some kind of desire to uh, actually maybe help help you uh, help others see it in a really fast, quick way. Because I, because I had to basically, I had to, I had to study it two or three times to get what I needed out of it. And I'm, and as an eight, sometimes moving fast, I had to really slow down, which is not a bad thing. But when you're getting 100 different messages in a day, sometimes that, that quick, fast thing really serves. So yes. There's me, get... there's me defending my, my social aid. <laughs> Everything. Good. I'll give you a rationalization too. Cool. <laughs> Just go. I want to go and get some water and I'll uh -huh. see you. I need to pee too. Bye bye. Cheers. Ingrid? Yes. Teresa here. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to go. This has been absolutely fantastic. I'll catch up on the recording. It's, um, it's 10 to 6 and I've got... Okay, so we're saying that the subtype is the mask of the mask. So the gluttony and the fixation are the masks of the original uh, wounding, trauma and suffering. And then we've got the mask of the mask, which we need to strip away if we're going to do any serious um, personal development, personal transformation. So this mask thing is an image that you need to get into your mind. The subtype is the mask of the mask. Okay, and the instincts and the, the subtype we need to highlight as red, alarm, not good, not lovely, not something to talk about as quirky or sweet, but to understand as a pervasive a uh, filtering of information and a preoccupation and a distortion. So that's why I've highlighted them as alarming and masks is because it's fundamentally a distortion and we need to get our thinking right around that. Okay, let's look at a bit of the psychodynamics of it. So what happens is the instinct gets filtered through the vice and through the fixation and one of them comes out dominant as the main ego um, fix, the main fixation. And that takes a specific form. So here I have done the, you can see we're talking about a, a five here. So the avarice gets, uh, so the instinct, all three instincts will get channeled through the avarice. One of them will be most fixated so in this case, if it's the sexual, then the self praise then the social, turns into the subtype, which has certain qualities, traits, behavioral uh, predispositions and preoccupations. So that's how it happens. The dominant instinctual wound, the glitch that happens at the, at the instinctual level, finds expression filtered through the vice and amplifies that particular vice in a specific way. So the instinct provides fuel for the vice 
and that turns into subtype. I hope that makes sense. So we've got the man fixation and then we've got what Ichazo called the co-egos or the other subtypes and generally in some kind of order. Ingrid, can I just ask you a question there? Sure. Who's talking? I can it's only Karen. see. It's Karen. It's Karen. Hi there. Um, so I think my question is, is this is actually beyond our control. In other words, this happens all uh, as a result of circumstance that we're born into and potentially whichever neurobiology is triggered. Yeah. So your parents' subtype stacking could have an implication for your own subtype stacking. Definitely, absolutely definitely, without a doubt, because their subtype is going to inform their parenting style and yours is going to be shaped in relation to that. I once heard a very nice analogy that a tree that grows up in a forest gets certain light that filters through the other trees and as a basis of that grows in a certain way and takes on a certain shape. So you now every tree grows in the context of other trees, all of us. Uh, and there's no such thing really as an individual. We all exist in a relational ecosystem. And in the Havel Hendricks and Imago training, they talk about how we mirror each other into being. So I think we, we should move away from uh, very individualistic thinking that's trained into us in the West and think more in terms of a kind of relationship ecosystem in which our subtype in, uh, stacking is very much connected to the system in which uh, we are nurtured or not. Yes, thank you. Pleasure, pleasure. So it's a combination very much of nature and nurture. Now, some people say the type is completely hardwired. There's an argument about what proportion of it is uh, nurture and context, but I don't think there's any doubt that it's a combination. Okay, then I just went into a little bit about one of the uh, counter types here to show just how different the counter types can be that you won't really recognize them. Um, so I'm not going to go into that. I don't think we've got time. This is a bit more detail around this filtering process. And then there's some stuff here about the stacking. And I mentioned it a little bit earlier uh, that, that the stacking is significant. There are 54 possible uh, combinations of subtype stacking um, and type. So we could talk about 27 subtypes or we could talk about 54 sub subtypes. And I've highlighted the ones here that um, just as a sexual subtype, what are the ways in which it might be difficult to get on with a conservation type? So I just wanted to use the example of the one I did already, going on holiday with a conservation type, a sexual type may, might find them too self-restrained, lacking boldness, conservative, wanting too much control because conservative types can um, be concerned with those things. A sexual type with uh, a, a social who's got sexual repressed will probably get frustrated for, for other reasons. So for example, a social type can get slightly awkward in an intimate one-on-one -on -one conversation. They, they kind of don't really know how to do it. <laughs> and um, so you do find these, these stackings influence our ability to connect with people, even within our own type. So the, the one who's got another instinct dominant feels a bit alien in one way or another. So the extreme intensity of a sexual subtype might be very alienating to a social subtype or to a self praise subtype. They, they don't relate and they could probably find it exhausting as well because of that intensity. So it all matters basically. Oh, and then the one thing I wanted to say that is important, tri-type 
I said it earlier that the subtype plays itself out in all three elements of your tri-type. So if you are a self-preservation three and you've got five, eight in your tri-type, you've got a self-preservation five, a self-preservation three and a self-preservation eight. Your subtype colors your whole tri-type. Yes, that's Renata for you. She's a self-pres three, five, eight. So in all three of them, it will be the self pres dominant. So if you know your tri-type, you'll be able to think, okay, yes, I've got seven, sexual, nine, sexual, four, sexual, definitely. And, and wing, six, sexual. So you can see this instinct playing itself out in every aspect of your type. So here I just illustrate that in a way that's a bit easier to see. So here, this is sexual highlighted. So you've got sexual, sexual, sexual in a 583 tritype, or it would be self press, self press, self press. So I think you're getting the, the picture. So you, it's very nice to look at these three things in combination because you can see how they come together in your whole reality strategy in your whole life, these three things come together and it brings a very sophisticated level of self-awareness if you're able to notice, okay, and I have to act, my action style is whatever, and um, to be able to notice the whole thing playing out. Ingrid, can you, can you share the, the definition of the tri-type again? Um, I missed that fundamental point, I think. Okay, what, what the tri-type is? Yeah, just the, the 5A3 in this example. Okay, um, I can show you the 5A3. Do you know what the tri-type is in general? I, I guess I don't. I thought I did, but I don't. Okay, so let me just go to that without having a, a particular example up. Um, where's a nice picture of the Enneagram? I've probably got one somewhere. Um, this is probably going to be a little bit uh, overwhelming, but I'm going to try it anyway. Okay, so here's a picture of the Enneagram. Also another Enneagram on one page. I love these things. So you see the red types here. The red is the gut center. The green is the heart center. And the right. blue is the thinking center. And every single one of us has a home base, which is our main. Oh, I got it. Thank you one from the other two centers. So Renata's a three, five, eight. I'm a seven, nine, four. I've got a strong six wing. So I'm bringing all those types to the table. And Renata's bringing her three plus her wing. So when we're collaborating, when we're getting anything done, we can see that playing out. Yeah, Renata? If you're liking, I can quickly show Alan where to find his tri-type on his coaching companion from Integrative. Perfect, yeah. I have it open. All right, I'll just quickly share my screen and I'll show you. So this is the coaching companion because it's good to know for your clients as well, Ellen. So if you look at the circle, three, five and eight are highlighted in color, right? So there's yeah. one from each of the centers. So out of eight, nine and one, if I look at the bar graphs, you can see that eight, nine and one are grouped together. Two, three and four are grouped together. Five, six and seven are grouped. So eight, nine and one action or body center, two, three and four, a heart or feeling center, five, six, and seven head or thinking centers. So whichever bar graph is highest out of eight, nine, and one is highlighted in color at the top. Out of two, three, and four, the highest bar graph is my three highlighted, and it's the highest overall, so it's my core type. And then out of five, six, and seven, the five is the highest. So that's highlighted. So when you're working with a coaching companion at a glance, you can see the tri type. So the one in second position of the second and third, the one in second position is the bar that's larger than the one in third position. So it's it's not necessarily looking at the overall bar graphs. What you're looking for is out of eight, nine, and one. Because sometimes I might my my two might have been higher than my eight, but mm -hmm. two is right. still in the feeling center. So if three is higher than two, then um, then that would be it's it's which bar graph is highest in each because we're looking for out right. of eight, nine, and one in action, which is highest. So eight is my action style. So I take bold 
action and quick to action like an eight out of two, three, and four, which is the highest bar graph. That's my feeling style, which is, means I put my feelings in the file labeled feelings to deal with later. And then out of five, six, and seven, five is my highest. So five is my, my thinking style which is, and, and then if we overlay what Ingrid is saying, the self-preservation, if I look here with subtype stacking, that self-preservation is very high and the social is very low, then I'm overlaying the self-pres on the three, the five, and the eight. So I just happen to be an example of what Ingrid happened to have by a coincidence, an example of in her slides. And so I can reference the descriptors of self press five, self press eight, and self press three. If I was looking to get an indication of what does it mean that my uh, that my thinking style is self press five, what does it mean that my action style is self press eight? That I've got elements that that I take. I'm not an eight, but I take action like an eight. I'm not a five, but I think like a five. That's the kind of flavor uh, of it. And you I hope think that helps press five and you act like a self press eight so that what Renata I think that was so brilliantly summed up thank you that was so succinct and brilliant thank you and Ingrid, super helpful I thanks ask... for the remedial training yeah. <laughs> can I ask a question and and this is to both of you and you know I'm I'm fortunate enough to teach the integrative Enneagram with Renata I've had my own um subtype stacking change so i've taken this and i was a one-on-one -on -one. i've taken it again i was a self-pres now both times the stacking would have been one-on-one -on -one self press social second time it's self-pres one-on-one -on -one social i love this notion that whatever the the main instinct is would carry across so my tri type is three seven eight but now i mean what what's your perspective about those changing because i it seems it's they don't change fundamentally, but their expression changes depending on context. And if your subtype stacking has changed on the test, it's, it's, it's a test result. It's the same thing as doing a, a, a test at different times in your life and coming out as a different type. It definitely doesn't mean that your type has changed. Um, Naranjo and Echazo thought that the tests were junk. They, they didn't endorse testing. And the reason is that discovering your type is part of the journey and it's a qualitative journey. So, you know, testing, testing is, is based on our modern ideas of psychometry and that these things can really be tested and that there's a value in, in getting an accurate type. In. I mean, we all know that it's really valuable to discover our core type and really realize, yes, this is me, this is what I'm doing. But I think you can't really trust the tests. You, you've got to live into it and discover and find out your type. And there are lots of different ways of doing that. Um, the subtypes is a really good way. Uh, I'll show you. I mean, I also do what Renata says. I don't think you should coach somebody until you have got their the subtype. Even if you have to spend four sessions getting to the subtype, you know, this is what I do. I've got subtype summaries that I've created, integrated mm. from a thousand teachers, but putting these in front of a client and right saying, okay, so you think you're a three, which type of three are you? Let's look at this. And then they'll say, oh, I think I'm the top. No, no. And then they, they spend time with it. So that helps. And then if you're looking at the lines, that also helps you know which subtype you are. So you will disintegrate down the line of stress to the subtype of the other type. So if I'm a self-preservation eight and I get triggered into my worst, I'm going to look like the worst of a self-pres five. That's how this thing works. And it's even a way of discovering your core type is to find the subtype that you are at your worst. So one of the ways I discovered I was a sexual seven is by discovering that at my absolute worst, I'm the worst of sexual one. So it was like a validation that I got my type right. The sexual six part of me goes to the sexual three part of me. No, and that would be true for Renata as well. I'm sure you can speak about how as a self-praise three, when things go wrong, 
And when you're at your worst, you won't look like any nine. You're going to look like a self-praised nine. That's Can right. you make that a little bit? Um, well, you can even see, I mean, Kathleen and I are both threes. Uh, Kathleen, uh, the last time I knew, identified as an Essex, and I think that's accurate. So, you know, I don't know, Kathleen, you would have to say you would go to Essex six, which is counterphobic six, which would be much more confrontational and aggressive than me as a, I would go to self press six and I'm going to be very warm because that's how I'm going to stay safe. And then similarly, you would go to Essex nine, which is fusion. And I would go to SP nine, you know, you know, and, and, and I definitely do. And I go into that whole kind of, um, uh, cocooning and and just going through the motions so so that's one way but I also know just speaking uh, to, to Kathleen that um, one of our one of our colleagues who was a three thought she was a self-pressed three until she came to co-facilitate with me and she I would arrive with a huge bag that had extra jackets, a scarf, flat shoes in case my feet got sore, uh, snacks, water, smoothie, lip pass. And I'd come in the morning and I'd put out the, the lip balm and the water and the water, and I'd bring a bottle of water in case the the the, th the glass falls over, and an umbrella and an extra jacket in case it's raining when I leave, and in case the air con's too cold, and snacks in case I don't have time to go for lunch. Like and she took one look at this and she at, at the end of four days, she said to me, I've realized I'm not self praise Like none of this is a concern for me in my million years. I've never done any of this. I, I'm so not self praise It's not my focus at all. So in that case, she wasn't even looking at subtype because when she looked at the subtype, she quite liked the self praise subtype and, and thought that that was what she was. But there's no, she, she recognizes now she has very little self praise. So you can look at it and identify from the point of view of subtype or actually looking at what is my focus. Yeah, I appreciate all of that. I'm, I'm torn and I'll go do more work on myself because I see both. I, I am clearly not social. Like that is such a distant third. I don't have to worry about that. But I can toggle between that and I go, yeah, I go to the, one-on-one -on -one six and the warmth six. I can do both, right? So I really resonate with, with both of them um, fairly equally. Mm. Yeah. So I think it's just part of the part of the journey of self-discovery, yeah. probably. Mm. Yeah. Mm. For sure. Thank okay. you. Great. So let's um, let's have a bit of a breakout group. I'd like people to have a chance to discuss this. I would have loved to have gone into a little bit more depth around that disintegration point. So SX5 goes to SX7. SX8 goes to the worst of SX5. In each case, when we are triggered in our subtype, we go to the worst of the corresponding subtype down the line. Okay, so that I think, I think that's a really, really helpful thing to work with with clients as well, yeah. you know, to know. And, and to have confidence, genuine confidence, that if you're working with a sexual two at their worst, which they have been in their life, they've gone to the dark side of sexual eight. You can guarantee it. You can trust the system and the insights of the system. Yep. Okay. Um, do you have any people do you want in a room and how long would you like the room to be? We must only have three people in a room mm -hmm. and the, the thing is just to each take a turn to talk about any uh, reframes, light bulb moments, or anything that's made a particular impression on you where you've had a realization. And each take a turn to share the most significant insight I've had tonight is, and, and just share what's coming up for you. So how long shall we do? It's, it's quarter past eight, so... We must do it for almost the rest of the session and just come back for a for a bit of feedback. Okay, 12 minutes. Yeah. Right. Okay, so we have 12 minutes with a 30 second comeback. And we are going into breakout. Hold on. In um I'm gonna move you and move. There we go. Okay, we've got a couple of rooms of four and some of three. Uh, 
and we're going into break uh, there's one group of four and in you're in a group of four so we're going into breakout in three two one I had a client yesterday who is an SP2 and she her try type is um so she takes action as an eight and then she feels as a two and she thinks last as a seven. So she towards the two hour session, uh, towards the end, she goes like uh, she becomes like really annoyed. I'm like, oh. So uh, she says, like, how can I, when I go through, like, you know, the shock phase, the Kubler-Ross, like when I'm at the bottom, how can I hold, how can I hold this pain? How can I learn to hold the pain? Because I become very destructive. I have very destructive behavior and it can take up a couple of months. And what she, what she is experiencing now is that she, um, they, the intervals of these low periods are becoming faster and faster. They're not as low as they used to be, but they are more regular, so shorter intervals. So I was thinking, okay, so what I've learned today, what is the best way to integrate in the coaching session? But to be honest, I told the group, I need to sleep on it because it was so much information. <laughs> oh, no. What do I have to do? <laughs> So that was uh, my insight, wh which is the best way I can integrate this practically in a coaching session. Yes. That is that a question or more that you want to go away and reflect on the insights? Well, I was I normally I usually have like one thing that pops up, but I I don't, I, I didn't affection it myself with one particular. So I was wondering what what would you advise or what would you suggest if you would hear this? So yes, that's a question. Yeah, yes. I think I would work with the the disintegration to SP eight as the. Uh, as one of the big focus areas like how does the person go into that armed survivalist mode when they are under stress and how does yeah. denial play out particularly in that I, I like to coach down the lines a lot so I would look at that so the defense mechanism of two is repression the defense mechanism of eight is denial so I would look at the self-preservation form of denial which yeah. is toughening up you know so I would look at that dynamic and then, you know, the line to four as well. Yeah, and actually the that's actually what this denial and this the the eight, the SP eight is I can see that, yes, very much so. Yeah, yeah. so the SP eight is the armed survivalist. Yeah, definitely. Even, uh, yeah. This of this tri type two eight seven is called the free spirit. So it's someone who is you know, quite free spirited generally, but the self praise version of it will look slightly different. If it were SX287, there would be an incredible intensity about it. And probably under stress, the person would become very rebellious and even potentially violent. Whereas the, the survivalist eight has got a different flavor. Okay. Do you have a name for all of these like different types? Really? Where can I, I find it's Catherine Forth. Um, I think I've got a list somewhere. Uh, but yes. One. And then also, you must listen to a wonderful podcast by John Lukovic. I'm going to type it in here. It's hilarious. It's terrible. It's just <laughs> awful. It's hilarious awful. and terrible. <laughs> but, it's called the Big Hormone Enneagram. What? It's a podcast. And there was one where they did something called the Tri-Type Roast, where they made a complete, or oh, they took every Tri-Type apart and gave them alternative names. So these names that we've got here, the Free Spirit, the, the Gentle Spirit is my one, they gave them an alternative uh, nickname, which much more honest and revealing so find that find your title <laughs> and listen to your roast okay. so mine to be the cave elf which is a good description 
<laughs> and Renata, what was yours? I don't know. I didn't listen to it. Did you tell did you tell me what it was? I obviously blanked it out. It must have been so awful. Um but Astrid, were you asking about names for tri-types or names for subtypes? Because all the subtypes have names. So Ingrid was talking about the subtype names there, but there's also oh. tri-type names. Tri-type names, yes. So the, oh, the tri-type names, yeah, here they are. Yeah. Oh, wow. Do, uh, so okay. if, it, if it's helpful to anyone, I actually have Catherine um, Paul's um, PDF on the tri-type. I'm quite happy to send it to Renata or to Ingrid um, to actually, it's really helpful, but it's really helpful little document. So um, right. it's, and that would be lovely. Okay, I'll get that across to you then, Renata. Great. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, yeah. Share it. Well, Lynn, you can actually just pop it in the chat right now. Yeah. The PDF? Yeah, yeah it's file. You can see it right at the bottom. All right, I'll do that. Hold on. Is my screen still on share? No. Mm -mm. No. So back. This here is from that fourth book. She, for each of the tri type for each of the tri type she has an archetype fears life mission and blind spot and she synthesizes the core fears etc from each of them it's quite a nice reference tool for okay. when you're coaching what i sometimes do is i'll put this in front of a client and i'll say does this ring true and if they're not sure about one element of their tri type i'll put both in front of them and and it's a very good typing tool for them to say yep that's me okay i i have her book i don't remember this chart in her book she, by the way they're all like for sale on her website uh the books yeah. that she has but i don't remember this chart um okay i've frozen so i'm i'm gonna have to i don't know can i log back out and come back in again everything's frozen on my computer sure. oh we can still hear you and see you perfectly Lynn. Yeah, but my files are frozen Oh, okay. Maybe well, don't worry, Lynn, then just stay. Forget about the file, just email it to me and I'll send it to quick, people that are here. Quick, just a quick question um, on, on this tri-type. Um, when I read it through, I wasn't sure whether it made any difference as to which your dominant type is in the tri-type in terms of the flavor, uh, because she seems to group them all together um under the one tri type irrespective of whether you have a dominant three eight or five is that correct mm -hmm. it, it makes a huge difference what your main type is so this would be generic but if you look at this as a three you're going to totally hone in on the three elements within here so if you're a three you're going to see fear of failure if you're a five you're going to see incapable so certain things will stand out to you much more and feel more relevant depending on your main type. Okay. So it's it, your main type is still the most important thing. Okay, so I managed to send it, guys. It's in the Thanks, it's darling. In the yeah, I'm just going to check if it's there. I just love the tri type because of this. This is what matters to me. The thing of the sexual five going to the sexual seven. It's very helpful to be able to point that out and to be able to even put the put the thing in front of a five and say, you know, this look like you. There's the two, you know, and to be able to say, okay, these are the seven subtypes. This is likely to be you at your worst if you're a sexual five. And they look at it and they say, oh God, yes. <laughs> and these things here. These uh, these posters, this guy Nick Helbig, very very nice. Um, his name is at the bottom of the slide here. He did these mind maps, which I also find very helpful. When you want to look at the dark side, this is his material is good. He says things here that really sting. Is it H-E-L-B-I-G? It's hard to see there. Yeah, Nick Helbig, H-E-L-B-I-G. His posters okay. are his website. Oh, there's also this poster. This is a Risa Hudson poster. 
So there are lots of wonderful resources. If you look at Nine Points magazine, that's Tom Condon. I used a lot of his work in these. Um, I'm going to put that in the chat because it's it's really, really helpful. Uh, he's written articles in Nine Points magazine for years, and his articles are called Fine Distinctions. And he gives an overview of each of the subtypes of the type and also each type and its wing. So he makes a very good differentiation between, say, a six with a seven wing, six with a five wing, sexual self breast social six. Very illuminating. So I can't find the chat anymore. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. I've done something. Oh, when you're sharing, it. you find the chat under the ellipsis, in the three little dots at the bottom. There's a drop down and you'll find the chat there. When I click on chat, nothing happens. Well, if you stop sharing, it'll help you. If you yeah. want to share chat. There we go. Okay, so Nine Points Magazine. It's free. Tom Condon and his series of articles on each of the types is called Fine Distinctions. And he's He's brilliant at typology because he does NLP and he really, really gets into precision about what each of the types look like. So, yeah, I think that kind of brings us to the end. It's getting past time. I'd be very grateful if you could put some feedback in the chat, like out of 10, how valuable was this and you no. Know, just for me to get a sense of what landed. I know you're the last people here, so I'm putting extra pressure on you. I should have asked earlier. Yes, go I think this would be very useful to do as a, a course. You know, like you're doing the course into the wounded heart. Um, I mean, if I just look at the amount of slides that you've got there, I get quite anxious because I feel like we haven't even covered a third of them. So, um, to actually yeah. build on this uh, would be really very very helpful i think if you could offer this as a course this is actually the course material for a course i did last year on the subtypes it was going to be a three-week course but because we spent really substantial time on each subtype it turned out to be a four-week course so for each of the subtypes we watched a video we listened to songs, we went into incredible depth on each subtype so that by the end of it, everybody came away with a kind of sense of what it is to be a social one or a self praise eight or whatever. And, and when you've done that work, uh, it's very embodied as well, which is great. So I think I will run that course again. It was very popular and people said that they never understood anything with that depth uh, before they saw a lot so I might do that again I, what, the way I like to work like I am with with some other people is tell me the date and I'll find other people so if my feeling would just be to do it sort of uh, you know there's been such a lot on offer I think people are feeling a little bit snowed under January February March maybe April maybe if you offered it sort of May time frame onwards because you've got You've got the Chris Herberts, you've got uh, the End to the Wounded Heart series. Um, and I just find there's generally a lot happening and, and my clients are feeling the same. That we've actually gone into 2021 at, at a huge pace. Um, okay. So I so don't that, know if people agree, it, but... Yeah, definitely. I think what I'll do then is in May, I'll do it as a full week because I was originally thinking we could do eight, nine, and one, two, three, and four, and five, six, and seven, each in a three-hour workshop, but it wasn't enough, you know. Uh, so, so I'll recap this introduction and go through some base theory, and then maybe two types per session. So I will do that. Yes. I think I'll do in May. Yes, that sounds lovely. So if you, you can let me know dates that would work and times, and we'll try and make it uh, at a time that people from other parts of the world can do. Yes. Cool. Yes. Yeah, it is very helpful. You'll have a level of depth in the subtypes that is much more comprehensive than you would get on most uh, 
most of the overview courses. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm cool. agreeing with uh, with uh, Karen as well. That that would be great, and hopefully I have the time to do the course. But the other thought I had was that. Um, when you are showing examples like you did with the, I think it was the SO5 maybe, if, um, you know, and so everything's sort of on one sheet for that type and subtype, what would be useful is as a handout before, if we had that for ourselves, um, then as you're talking through the example on SO5, we can be looking at, okay, SX7 for the, me, the words are, you know, for me, the fixation is this and, you know, because otherwise I'm flipping through the book because I don't know everything by heart and I'm like trying to recreate it on the fly to make context for myself or somebody I know, but I mean, most of us are first trying to get it for ourselves. Yeah, yes. I'm also looking at it for my boyfriend because I'm trying to understand him, but. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and I'll beat your partner first. Uh, <laughs> yes. It's how it works. You, I mean, I like to do that increasingly now. That, I mean, you were on the seven one. So to get that workbook to come to quite a deep understanding and then to come to the, uh, the, the contact time and spend more time in process like we are now, you know, comparing notes, asking questions and, and reviewing some of the, the content rather than having to work through it like we are tonight. It's more like a seminar than a workshop. But thanks, Karen. I like to work like that. Someone says, aren't you doing something on this? And I say, okay, cool, let's. <laughs> no, I wonder too whether or not, you know, I know we're going to be looking, uh, we would look at this, the, the subtypes in that, but also just to try, I mean, maybe it's just a design, it wouldn't fit into this, but perhaps the tri-type, um, how when, you know, when our ego, when our ego, our general core ego is not, functioning in our de in our defense how we you know, we also pick up some of the the structures of the ego of each of those types with that would that work in this too because i'm fascinated by that it would have to be a separate program that's too much there's, okay. there's too much to do that at once like the dynamics within our tri-type what we yeah. use where and when yeah and the pitfalls of that you know like yeah the time I have to manage my four and nine seven you know if you've done work on your main type then you know you might have some some access to the higher quality but then you get derailed by your other tri-type elements right. quite a, yeah mm. Mm. okay so someone's saying that uh, they're not able to ex um, to download the tri-type um, so um, I know we're not just... I've uh, also got something. We can email it. I think I've, Renata... I've downloaded it, so um, I can always. I'll send it. Uh, cool. Thanks, Ian. Right. Thank you. That Great was really session. lovely. Really enjoyed it. Right. Thanks, Thank everyone, everybody. for coming. Thanks, Stay everyone. Have a good weekend. You See too. you next time. Bye. 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 Lots of love. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. You recorded. <laughs>